Nor you might want to move away from Kivy, as wonderful as Kivy is. Ah, yes, sorry. <laughs> no worries. Okay, um, we are good to go while Nor's moving. Nor you might want to move away from Kivy, as wonderful as Kivy is. Um, while Nor's moving and getting situated, do people want to go around and um, just uh, say their names and we can get started that way? Can I go first? Yes, go right ahead. Yes, my name is Max and I am from Vermont. I am a person on the autism spectrum and I work for Green Mountain Self Advocates and I do work with the Self Advocacy Resource and Technical Assistance Center, uh, SARTAC. And, uh, I am happy to be on this panel. Awesome. Nor, are you are you ready to go? Okay. Do you want to ask the first question? It's the introduction question. Absolutely. Uh, did we want to go around and do names and pronouns first, though? Uh, yeah, that's that's fine. Okay. Um. So hello everyone, welcome to our racial justice and neurodiversity panel. Um, we are going to go around and do a quick round of name and pronouns. So whichever of our panelists would like to jump in first. I just did, but I did not say that he, uh, I did not say he, him, his. Raya, she, they. Hello, this is Sandy Ho, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. This is Lydia XC Brown, and my pronouns are they, them, or just my name. Buenos dias. My name is Hector Ramirez. I am Chicago Passion Mexican, two spirits. My pronouns are uh, he, she, them, I'm autistic. Thank you, I'm so honored to be among this amazing group of people, all of them uh, superstars that I've admired for so long. Awesome, we're really happy to have all of you here. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and get into our first question, which is there are a lot of societal issues that need to be addressed under both the racial justice and neurodiversity umbrellas. Can you talk about some of the areas you're working in? This is Hector, can I, can I start the conversation? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. So um, I serve on the board of uh, the National Disability Rights Network, um, which help oversee all the protection advocacy um, agencies for the, for the United States in each state and territory. And one of the things that I've been working uh, with them um, is basically really working aggressively, especially right now during COVID, uh, to obtain federal support for advocacy on behalf of people with disabilities. And we really expanded the definition of that to move away from kind of the narrow definition of only providing uh, advocacy for people in institutions, uh, for people uh, with intellectual disabilities, um, and really expanded that to people with any disability uh, in any type of setting where they might be in the country right now, um, particularly right now with the issue of congregate settings, uh, the spread of COVID-19, uh, those are, are peers in jails, uh, but then definitely also uh, helping our immigrant communities, especially those individuals uh, that are currently detained in immigration detention centers or uh, what they really are concentration centers. So we really kind of have expanded that definition uh, of disability rights, moving from disability rights to really taking more of a disability justice approach. Because if there's anything that we found out is that it doesn't matter what rights we have right now. Uh, if there's no enforcement, if there's no justice, uh, especially for communities of colors, we have seen that it doesn't matter how many rights supposedly we have. So we really have been, I've been working 
uh, you know, to do system change, to move from a, a disability rights type of uh, framework to a disability justice. Um, and now we're transitioning to a more restorative justice approach uh, to try to resolve some of the issues that we have been facing. Is there a particular order of, whoops, uh, who wants to go or do we just talk? Um, we don't have a particular order, so feel free to jump in. All right. So, all right. My answer is this for uh, question number one. Um, so we must work to end racism. Um, and until that happens, people with disabilities will never be free. And we are at an important part of our movement's history to address both of these uh, societal issues. Um, because it is hard to know what to do, a lot of people within the disability world are reluctant to talk about, uh, talk or think about racism, but we can't ignore this problem. Everyone has to uh, help end racism. Not, no one can fix everything all at once, but there is always a way to help. Um, we have two tools that we use. We worked with our board for more than a year to adapt Georgetown University's cultural competence assessment tool. Uh, we rewrote the questions in plain language. We are still tweaking it, um, adding examples to make it easier to understand. Um, having these basic questions makes it easier for us to have real conversations about how we are supporting people from different cultures, cultures to learn about self-advocacy. And doing an assignment is key, but we are also making plans to make sure our groups and events are respectful and accepting of all self-advocates. Um, when George Floyd was murdered, we had already been meeting for months, twice a week with peer leaders from more than 30 states. Many thanks to um, uh, the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network for doing the lion's share of work on creating plain language booklet, a plain language booklet um, about racism and police brutality. Um, throughout June, we had some tough conversations during the national Zoom meetings uh, for many uh, reading the ASAN um, booklet was the first time uh, they've learned about the history of systemic racism in our country. Um, this is a great tool to have frank conversations about how training alone is not going to make a change. Um, it is not a bad idea to talk to police, but the real heart of it comes from changing laws and policies and training is not going to solve the issue of police brutality. We need to, we need new laws for the police system as a whole on how they patrol and how they interact. And these laws must be enforced. And the way we can make change is making noise through our legislators our representatives and all that good stuff. That's my answer to number one. This is Lydia. Uh, I'll speak really briefly to this too. When we talk about racial justice and neurodiversity, for me, it's very difficult to name one, two, or even three specific things that are, here are the things I'm working on that relate to both issues. Because everything that I do, all of my work is built on the principles and the framework of disability justice, which understands that all of our work, all of our communities, all of our movements, and all of our issues are deeply intertwined and interconnected. So all issues that we think about as racial justice issues, access to housing, access to education, freedom from coercion, surveillance and criminalization, the right to migrate between countries, the right to humane treatment while at work, the right to reproductive health care and support, the right to be able to make decisions about our relationships and our families, the right to be able to love who we love, the right to be able 
to live without fear of violence from our partners, our families, the healthcare system, schools, our neighbors, or the police. Those are all also issues of disability rights and disability justice. And so nothing that we talk about can be split into that's really a racial justice issue and it's not a disability issue, or this is really neurodiversity focused or disability rights is focused and it does not relate to racial justice at all because everything that we work on is connected. How it affects particular people and communities will always be different. That white disabled people will always experience privilege that disabled people of color Black, Brown, Indigenous, Latinx, and Asian people will not experience. And that non-disabled people of color will always have certain experiences that disabled white people will not necessarily experience too because of the uneven impacts of ableism and because of how racism operates as a system of power. But for me, when you ask me, what am I working on right now and how does it highlight those connections? I can talk to you about a couple of things. Number one, I founded and I lead the fund for community reparations for autistic people of colors, interdependence, survival, and empowerment. And this fund, which is the only project of its kind, gives money directly back to autistic people of color to be able to do basically whatever they would like, as long as it doesn't cause harm to somebody else or contravenes principles of neurodiversity or racial justice. We will not let somebody use funding for ABA, for example, but if someone wants funding to help with rent or to buy art supplies, then we will try our best to support that. And that fund exists out of recognition that racism and ableism operate together. Therefore, how we respond to racism and ableism must go together as well. We are a fund that is led by people who are all autistic people of color, and we give back and support other autistic people of color. And we do that both by receiving donations from other directly impacted community members, and sometimes from people who have more access to privilege and resources than we do. And we redistribute those funds and return them to communities that have been extracted and exploited. Number two, in my policy work, uh, in a couple of different roles, I work on a number of issues. In my work with the Autistic Women and Non-Binary Network, we work to uplift issues affecting trans and non-binary autistic people in particular. And as many of us know, and you heard earlier, if you were there for the panel on LGBTQ rights and disability rights intersections, that many of us autistic people are trans or queer, perhaps more of us, um, not perhaps, definitely more of us than in the overall population and that more queer and trans people are autistic than in the overall population. But even in autistic community space, we experience the same effects of marginalization and discrimination as elsewhere, which is why autistic people of color have always talked about the importance of representation and leadership in a community that still is affected by racism and by white supremacy. It's why we talk about the importance of uplifting queer and trans autistic people in a community that although is brilliantly and wonderfully queer and trans in so many ways, still is centered around assumptions of straightness and of people being cis. And so in my work with AWN, we work to bring the perspective of neurodiversity and disability rights and disability justice into trans and gender justice spaces. We just published a report that we're really excited about. And we're really excited that so many other autistic groups and organizations, ASAN, smaller groups like the Pittsburgh Center for Autistic Advocacy, the group in Canada are doing this work because that's where our focus needs to be on lifting up autistic people at the margins of the margins. And lastly, in my policy work at the Center for Democracy and Technology, I've been looking at the ways that algorithms and artificial intelligence discriminate against disabled people. And that might sound like something that really just affects only some autistic people, but in reality falls hardest, just like anti-queer and anti-trans discrimination on autistic people of color. And so when we look at the effect of algorithms and cutting people's access to benefits, the, uh, the disabled people, including autistic people that are most likely to be harmed by loss of access to benefits are going to be low income people of color and, que and or queer or trans disabled people who have the least access to resources to be able to fight back and even to keep the benefits that are necessary to stay alive and to keep living. And, you know, I, I'm so excited to be part of this panel too, because I know that everyone else that's speaking now is also working on the front lines on issues that affect our community and particularly autistic people of color. And I, I'd be happy to share more about this as we continue the rest of this evening. 
Thank you so much for sharing. Go ahead. Hi, this is Sandy Ho, and I'm so thrilled to be here um, on this panel, in particular with some uh, several co-schemers in community in, in various um, parts of the disability community. So, um, I can I am I'm, I'm going to be speaking. I think from um, my work both as a research associate at the Lurie Institute um, and also as the project manager of the Community Living Policy Center there, um, the center's mission, which is to improve policies and practices that keep disabled people in the community. And as both Max and Lydia mentioned um, previously, you know, a lot of the systemic um, barriers uh, and inconsistent federal, state, and local policies and the ways that systemic oppression um, are experienced by uh, disabled people of color um, can prevent them from exercising exercising their rights uh, in in order to remain in the community um, and to fully access home and community based services, which is one of the issues that the Community Living Policy Center um, several projects on. Uh, one of which uh, ASAN is is one of our proud partners um, in this work, um, and and also of course you know none of us can. Um, ignore the, the national context of this conversation and the work that all of us are doing today, which is um, the ways that COVID-19 and, and the pandemic um, are is also um, has disparately impacted disabled people of color. Um, and then uh, outside of the Larry Institute and the Community Living Policy Center, I'm also the founder and co-organizer of the Disability and Intersectionality Summit. So. DIS has always been about bringing our community and multiply marginalized disabled people of color together in ways that center multiple forms of access. Um, it is organized by disabled activists from across the country, uh, it celebrates our community and, and really reminds us that, you know, we are all of us here more than somebody else's tick box, more than somebody else's headline, and that we as our, our own community have our own work um, to celebrate and to center and to elevate. Um, and so Disability and Intersectionality Summit has always been a place that elevates the experiences and, and contributions of marginalized disabled people of color. So um, those are two of the main areas that I'll be speaking from today, but again, I'm just so pleased to be here. Thanks. Excellent, thank you for sharing. Um, would, uh, Raya, Hector, would either of you like to go ahead? I'll go. <laughs> um, okay, uh, so I'm super excited to be here. Hi, everybody. Um, and I just wanted to like pre-context that um, for me, like COVID really was an obstacle to a lot of the things that I usually do um, because my my where I find myself usually is space holding and space making, um, and virtual space is an, a partial obstacle for me. Um, so yeah, uh, what did I write down? I'm sorry. <laughs> With COVID, there are a lot of changes and challenges. There were things that became inaccessible with um, while other things I'm learning to step into. I mostly do collective work. Um, some friends and I just released an accessible activism guide that also includes some information on how to spot and support a meltdown that we were able to put together with community feedback. Shout out to everybody who submitted feedback. You guys are amazing. Um, I also serve as a diversity and inclusion position with Star Institution, ah, Star Institute for Sensory Processing. And I'm super excited that I've been able to team up with them um, and their goals to integrate disability justice with um, into occupational justice that they already have been growing into within their occupation therapy practice. Um, I do do do. I'm also um, developing curriculum in collaboration with um, a couple of professors uh, that's around disability justice. Um, as well as um, I'm talking, what is it? There's a grant coming up that I'm applying for that involve, that would help me to basically where I live, well, like I'm in, I'm, 
one of the, the the community that is really important to me is North Omaha and they're predominantly black. And one of the first things that I started to notice when I was learning more about accessibility is how we don't have blind accessible crosswalks. And that's a problem for me. And it's a, it's a, it's annoying how downtown's right across the street and they have blind accessible uh, crosswalks, but you know, predominantly na black neighborhood right across the street, all of a sudden like, and I, I have this growing concern um, that yes, COVID has caused obstacles because I it's hard for me to like make phone calls and, and do emails, but my friends are helping me um, where I'm just trying to figure out like, you know, how, how can I get my black disabled people outside safely? <laughs> I would like to see that. That would bring joy to my heart. Um, and let's see, there are also some things that are in the works that I am having to build myself up to, such as um, uh, accessible virtual spaces, such as the info dump presentation party that we held earlier in the year. Um, where, where neurodivergent and autistic folk were able to come in with their special interests and just info dump via presentation. And it was amazing. Um, and overall, I'm still trying to find my space in all of this. Um, I'm still learning how to grow into disability justice and abolition, but I find that through conversation, collaboration, self-organization, we can accomplish a lot. Excellent. Thank you all so much for sharing. And as we've noticed, like there's a really large amount of stuff to do and we're all tackling different areas of it. And I am really glad that we've got like such a broad, broad range of stuff and ideas um, that we're talking about. And that kind of leads into my next question, which is, so we've kind of touched on this throughout this question, but what systemic issues are keeping disabled people of color from accessing disability related services and medical treatment. So for, so one example of this would be uh, racial disparities in terms of autism diagnosis. Um, and anyone can feel free to start on this one. And if not, I can kind of popcorn around. I guess I'll take the code of silence as probably me going first if, unless someone else had to. But um, for me, I have autism and I was a black student in a mostly white school and I was a mystery to some people. Um, but you look at me now and you see that I have a career as a professional advocate. And that was not the track I was going on in high school um, ableism was alive and well in my high school. Many of my fellow students without disabilities were filling out, you know, applications to four-year colleges, and I was stuck in the dish pit. Um, in the self-advocacy world, we call this low expectation syndrome, if you want to put that in quotes. Um, People of color with disabilities are capable of more than, you know, washing dishes. Um, so please do not assume what we can or cannot do. And society continues to send a strong message that we are not capable and we are too slow. And it ties into the false idea that people with uh, disabilities are not able to do a lot of things for ourselves like adults. Unfortunately, it is a pretty broadly accepted mindset. Um, it is huge and it casts a shadow over our desires to work, um, go to college, get married, have kids, and the list goes on and on. Um, a peer leader from Vermont said this, uh, um, and I quote them, at work when I was, okay, at work uh, when there w is a big load of groceries, I try to keep up. It is hard to keep up. It's fast pace and I cannot do a fast pace. At night, I write in my journal about work. I tell myself 
it is okay to be slow. Um, so we have been fighting ableism for hundreds of years. And thank you for being our allies in the struggle to move toward true inclusion. Uh, but, and also thanks for uh, recognizing that we have dreams like everyone else, but we know that a real life looks like in the community, we know that. And as you know, the self-advocates becoming empowered, SABE SABE said many years ago, let's just do it. This is Lydia. I'll add to that, Max, that one of the biggest reasons that I see that autistic and other disabled people of color are unable to access adequate quality, respectful or culturally responsive healthcare is the effect of trauma, intergenerational trauma, historical trauma and collective trauma. So many people in communities of color have faced the horrors of forced medical experimentation, of denial of access to health care, and of forced and involuntary treatment. And this has been true for many specific communities, whether how gynecology was built on experiments done on a group of enslaved Black women, whether it is through denial of access to care of people living in colonized communities, whether that has been abroad or in areas that the United States still exercises control over in Puerto Rico, in Hawaii, and in other places, whether that has been in denial of care to immigrant communities, Chinese laborers, Latinx migrant workers, whether that has been in the experimentation that took place at Tuskegee on black men, whether that has been in experiments at Fernald, which were not necessarily to my knowledge done specifically only on people of color, but were done on the basis of disability, right? Where disabled children were fed a radiated cereal just to see what would happen. Whether it is what happens at the JRC, which ASAN aired a video earlier about today, and the JRC's population is 90% people of color. Uh, it is 85% Black and Latinx. And in all of these ways, we see how all of the usage of both medical treatment and psychiatric treatment as a threat or a hold over our lives, as well as denial of access to treatment, will create a situation where many people will understandably be very reluctant to seek out care, even if it is care that we might want. Or when we are trying to seek out care, where what we will find is refusal to provide care to us that is respectful of who we are and where we come from, and that actually addresses the issues that we have. And you hear this in the trans community, we talk about it as trans broken arm syndrome. You walk in, you say, my arm is broken. The doctor says, well, let's talk about your gender. Your arm is broken. It's not about whether you're trans or not. Or we would see it happen when people with developmental disabilities and especially people with intellectual disabilities will go in for a routine procedure like need your tooth removed. Then you walk out and half your teeth have been taken out because the staff thought it would be an interesting experiment to help teach students how to do tooth extractions because it's on a person that they have deemed does not matter as a human being. And so when we face all of those kinds of realities today, let alone historical legacies, of being pathologized, that is treated like we were wrong just for existing, like being a person of color makes us ill or sick or wrong, or being queer or trans makes us ill or sick or wrong, then understandably we're going to have a lot of trouble finding care that can respect us and that meets our actual needs. And I mean, you can even just look at histories of that we don't talk about as much, but we should that Marsha P. Johnson, who is one of the leaders of the Stonewall Riots, a trans woman of color, was also known to be mentally ill or psych disabled. And she was in and out of involuntary psychiatric commitment. That it was very common in the 20th century and still is for Puerto Rican nationalists from the Boricua, B-O-R-I-C-U-A community, right? As well as black protests and movement leaders to be diagnosed with psychosis or schizophrenia for doing activism. And then today, when those of us who are disabled are trying to be identified or recognized as disabled, 
We then run into the opposite problem of being told, well, that's not you because autism is a white boy thing. Well, it's not really who you are because it is, you know, a certain type of white nerd like Sheldon on Big Bang Theory or Rain Man. And you don't match that primarily because you're not white. So we're not going to recognize you as who you are. And then you compound that with the histories and the legacies of structural racism and ableism as to who can even go to nursing schools, to social work school, to medical school. And we see that the vast majority of providers in all these fields do not look like us, do not come from our communities, that the vast majority of providers are white and or non-disabled. And that means that even when we're trying to find care that we want, it is that much harder to find someone who we don't have to feel like we have to be on guard with or have to defend our basic lives and our basic identity and our existence to. Someone who understands where we come from and who might understand why we might want to undergo certain procedures or might want to never undergo certain procedures. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. There's a lot of ground to talk about for this question. Um, Raya, you had your hand up. Would you like to go next? Thank you. Um, okay, so I I already knew that by this question, it was going to be a lot of overlapping over each other, which is not a bad thing. I'm happy for it. Um, so to kind of piggyback off of what Lydia brought up. Um, so there is there's like three really big points and then there's some other like sub points after that. So there is disparity of access, which is having a lack of resources to knowing what a diagnosis is, to having a doctor who knows what that diagnosis is, to have a doctor who's willing to recognize that in a body of color, um, to have access to go to a doctor, um, to have access to then afford and like all of the steps in order to go about that route. And then there's um, the despair, the, the trauma of narrative, disparity and trauma of narrative, which is um, having a cultural history um, that would then, what's the word, like as, associates itself with having a distrust with doctors, um, not seeing um, representation of color and, and to know that that's something that can exist in our bodies and that's something that's okay, like how, going over what does autism look like. I know with me, um, when I was sorting through everything, my first thing was looking for people who looked like me to understand if I could fit in, like what did that look like in my body? What did that look like with my cultures? And like that's the aspect that gets mixed a lot. Um, and I know I go over, I'm gonna go over that a little bit more in the later questions, but like, yeah, like every, whatever diagnosis that exists, like also merges with our cultural experiences, like there, but it's assumed that white is the default. And so that becomes a problem. Uh, and then what is it? Being looked down, being looked at through um, a, a historical tense that assumes the worst of you. That's also an obstacle that we experience. Um, and then we, um, people of color are more likely to be misdiagnosed, um, especially when it comes to tr trying to illustrate, oh, sorry. We're more likely to be misdiagnosed, especially whenever it's to portray our challengeness, challengingness as the problem. Um, so like how there's a sick, within autistic individuals um, in other, there's like more likely that you'll be diagnosed with ODD, um, uh, which plays out into problems in the legal system. Um, when so like when you're challenging this of just saying and seeing something isn't right something isn't okay becomes now you're a problem and so now you have a diagnosis that kind like pretty much pushes you closer into the the school prison pipeline um let's see we were also what is it? 
when when we struggle, we're more likely to be seen as bad. And when we do well, we're more likely to be seen as assimilated. And being that we are more likely to tuck in our pain that we experience due to um, having to already compromise with environments that make us feel unsafe. Um, and then again, school to prison pipeline is an obstacle um, because I, I, I'm just assuming that they, they're not readily trying to diagnose people in prisons. Um, there is then, yeah, the, the cultural differences, um, although characteristics, cultural characteristics and neurodiverse, sorry, uh, although characteristics and neurodivergences naturally have similarities, there are cultural aspects that could cause someone without the awareness to not see what is a cultural behavior um, rather than it being um, like a disorder. Um, and then seeing, and then whoever the diagnos diagnostician is, um, perceiving something that they think is odd behavior, which is actually like something that would be a diagnosis. Um, and so like that happening both ways. And um, uh, I think the last point that I had was that although things like racism is disabling by design, we, as we are experiencing that, we don't have uh, because of our history, we also we often don't have like the like the awareness or resources because it's so pivoted towards whiteness to be able to know that we can get help and how to get help. Um, and so it's it's really difficult. And then there's aspects of like poverty um, and homelessness and um, and yeah, like within the black community, it's. It, it for me like it took me to discover that I was autistic to then be exposed to the world of black disabledness and that's a problem that I had to find out and understand my own disabledness before I had access to my own parts of my community that like and my, like my face is getting all watery but it is it's really overwhelming because we want to have that connectedness but if our community is still going through that trauma and we're like they're associating that that trauma and mixing it with their ableism then that's leaving out our disabled leaders within our communities and that's also going to mean that disabled kids aren't having access to um, disabled adults and disabled adults might be separating themselves from other disabled adults and so there's that separation and yeah i'm just gonna stop there <laughs> <laughs> Lydia, can I just add quickly to what Mariah was saying that one of those awful ways that racism and ableism show up that you were talking about is that we are both more likely to be labeled with certain kinds of disabilities, especially more stigmatized ones that may or may not actually be accurate. And we're less likely at the same time to be accurately identified as or recognized as disabled when we are disabled for so many reasons, not just with being autistic, but with many other types of disabilities and especially types of disabilities that are caused because of the effects of environmental racism, for example, race-based stress trauma, developmental disabilities caused by lead poisoning in Flint, autoimmune conditions and cancers that are caused by fracking and by pipelines and spillages, disabilities like asthma that are caused and exacerbated by unsafe and unsanitary living conditions that poor people of color are more likely to be subjected to. And it's just this awful cycle where both are true at the same time. It's both racist and ableist to label us with certain types of disabilities that are not true. And it's racist and ableist to refuse or fail to recognize when we are disabled. Excellent, thank wanna, you both. Oh, sorry. Sorry, go ahead. I did wanna add because Lydia reminded me of a thing I wrote down and didn't um, read. Um, was it medical and academic racism, language barriers. Um, I've, I've been seeing a, huge, a lot of research on how just not having 
the information in, in languages is huge, which should be a given. Um, and then the environmental bias, like um, I was talking with an activist about how in their community, um, they're, they're black autistic and in their community, they work a lot with black autistics and they experience this challenge of, because they know that there's lead poisoning in the community that the assumption is that these autistic boys and girls and other individuals, like especially, I just wanted to highlight the autistic boys just because of how black men are usually seen as aggressive. It's in black boys are seen as aggressive and how they're aged. Um, and so they assume that it's just lead poisoning and they assume that it's just like something to toss aside, even though if it is lead poisoning, you still shouldn't toss it aside. But there are access needs. There are um, there's community supports that's needed. Like so, yeah. Basically, like autistic kids are being assumed to have lead poisoning instead of black autistic kids are being assumed to have lead poisoning instead of understanding that they're autistic and that there are community steps that can happen within like autistic supports that aren't ableist and horrifying. That was, that was it, sorry. No, you're completely fine. Thank you both for talking about that. I feel like particularly when we're talking about environmental racism, there's a lot that tends to get kind of buried when we're talking about this. Um, just uh, since we had an accommodation request in the chat to um, explain acronyms, ODD is Oppositional Defiance Disorder, uh, which is a condition in the DSM that is characterized as a pattern of angry or irritable mood, being argumentative or having quote unquote defiant behavior. Um, and as we've touched on, uh, it tends to be disproportionately applied to students of color. Um, and Hector wanted to go next. Yeah, def thank you, definitely. Um, I, I, I wanna just uh, double on what everybody has been shaking. Uh, I'm only 45 years old, uh, so I think I'm still young, I, even though I'm a little bit grayer. I, you know, at, at four, I grew up at a state hospital and, and came out, so I've had kind of different experiences than most typical people do. And I hear a lot of the work that I do, you know, over the years has been trying to deal with particular issues of my identity as a disabled person, as a native person, as a gay man, then two spirits, you know, constantly coming out, constantly having to fight for another part of who I am. And like right now with COVID, I think when we talk about what is the main issue that is holding, you know, the autistic people back, the neurodiverse people back, and it's just one simple word, it's just racism, plain and simple racism. Uh, you know, let's not call it anything else, just call it out what it is. Um, you know, when I was four years old, I was taken away from my family because I was Native American and I had been giving an autistic diagnostic. And back then, you know, we had federal laws. I mean, we still do that could remove children, you know, from indigenous peoples and just take them away. It's happening right now. So, I mean, well, a lot of these issues are kind of more of a colonial kind of mind frame. All of us are still working within the system to try to fix it. And as somebody who's been part of you know, some really toxic organizations where I was just a token and I was trying to change it from inside, it doesn't work. You have to really dismantle it. You know, all of these issues that we have have been around for so long for a reason. They were meant to really control people and take away, you know, our, our, our self-determination. So I think right now, you know, we have a pandemic, you know, that is affording us the opportunity to really reshape the direction our society is going. So many of us in the disability community are dying on a daily basis or being killed and shot just for the color of our skin, you know? And I think me as, as somebody who's been doing this for a while, the only best thing that I can do is just get out of the way and make room, you know, for those black voices that need to be heard right now, you know, because I think that's what I was kind of waiting for later on. You know, and that's why I wanted other people to speak first because I think that's what we all need to do right now in the disability community. How do we send in solidarity? Even if we've been doing this for a while, we get out of the way and we uplift the voices of our black communities right now. And we just start really, really addressing the issue in the room that has been killing us for decades. There is no more expensive health crisis in this country than racism. And as a native person, you know, I have to tell you, I've had so many people in my family contracted COVID. 
I just had my ankle that yesterday, you know, and the reason that that happened was because of the color of his skin, plain and simple, plain and simple. And that is happening to all of our communities right now. We're getting shot, we're getting poisoned, we're getting killed. And I think even as a disability community, this is where we really kind of, you know, stand in solidarity with each other and we lift our black, you know, our black community members and we lift them up right now. That's, 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 that's one of the ways that we do it. And we, we do it with love, we do it with respect and we do it with solidarity because nobody's hurting more right now than, than our, black, our black brothers and sisters and all of our people of color. Uh, literally, that's what we're seeing right now, the major consequences, racism, racism, and that person that's been there for four years. Thank you for sharing that with us. And I'm really sorry for your loss. Um, would, so um, I do wanna take a moment to acknowledge that talking about these issues can be really, really intense and very emotionally and physically challenging. And I want to encourage everyone, both our panelists and the people participating to engage in self-care and to try and like, make sure that while this is an important conversation to listen to, to pace yourselves and to do what you need to do to self-regulate. Um, would anyone else like to chime in on this topic before we move to the next question? Hi, yeah, this is Sandy, and I just wanted to uplift and reemphasize what my co-panelists have already said. Um, and to build off of Hector's point around um, racism as a public health issue, you know, when I was thinking about my response to this question, I was thinking about the story of Henrietta Lacks, who would have been 100 this, uh, this past summer. And this is uh, the story of a black woman who was diagnosed with terminal cervical cancer in the 1950s um, and you know, received horrific um, you know, abuse to uh, you know, the willful ignorance of her consent, her economy, her agency, um, throughout her treatment at, at Johns Hopkins University, a, an institution that, you know, actively contributed to the medicalization of poor Black communities. And I think that, you know, what was interesting um, as I am, am revisiting the story of, of Henrietta Lass is that, you know, the word disability is never mentioned in the book by Rebecca Skloop. And for me, as a reader, that is something that signals to me that not only is disability perceived as an outcome in the public health field, but even more so, it's the focus on the diagnosis, right? And so we, when we hear about the ways that the author of this story um, interviews members of Henry, Henrietta Lass's family, you know, we hear about how they're talking about the ways that you know, literally everybody else in the world has benefited from HeLa cells, um, except for members of her family who still, you know, had been struggling with consistent access to health insurance, um, or continue to live in systemic poverty. And um, so when I was thinking about the systemic issues, like that was the story that came to mind for me. Um, poverty, access to healthcare, you know, transportation, um, and and so that so that was just one thing that I wanted to to share uh, in this answer. But also, you know, as we are today shifting towards remote and uh, Wi-Fi access and telehealth, um, you know, that is leaving out many marginalized disabled people of color who do not have Wi-Fi access, ass assistive tech. Um, accessibility and you know as as we are entering into this quote unquote new normal whatever that even means um you know I, I i think that we will continue to see the ways that marginalized disabled people of color in particular continue to be left behind um in in what is perceived as these new solutions um but thank you for Yeah, definitely. So our next question, um, so we've kind of talked about this and this is kind of, as Raya has said, like come up as an overlap. Um, so systemic oppression has, as we know, a disparate impact of 
disabled people of color. So some of the examples we've already touched on here include the school to prison pipeline, substandard access to care, um, and police brutality, police violence. So the two questions that kind of go together here are, what are some changes that need to happen at the policy level to address these problems? And how can we start to build new systems without these inherent biases and barriers built in? This is Lydia. I know that I have to leave a little early because of a scheduling conflict. So I want to make sure to quickly address this before I do. And I know Hector, you have your hand up too. And I, I want to hear what you have to say. And I will hopefully be able to come back and watch the remainder of the conversation later. For me, the most important thing to think about when changing or trying to change policy is always who is in the room and who has the power in the room. I don't actually like the, the use of words like diversity or inclusion, not because I think they're inherently bad or offensive or wrong, but because usually when people talk about diversity and inclusion, what they mean is let's keep status quo the same. Let's keep power structures the same way they always have been before without actually fundamentally altering them. So rather than ceding power by the white wealth privileged, education privileged, cis and straight people who've always held the bulk of power, we'll keep those people in power but extend an invitation to a few people of color, a few disabled people, a few queer and trans people, and maybe some people that have more than one of those marginalized identities or experiences at the time. But but we're not going to change the power structure. And the way that policy has to be done, if it's going to be done in a way that is responsive to and accountable to the needs of most directly impacted communities is by those who have power agreeing and understanding that they need to cede power and return that power to the communities from whom that power has always been denied and for whom that power has always been, we've always been deprived of that power. And when those who are directly impacted the most and have the most to lose from any particular policy discussion, whether it's about fair housing or whether it's about access to homelessness services or whether it's on mental health care or immigration or militarization abroad, like whatever it is, when the people who have the most to lose are the ones that are making the decisions, that hold the power, that have the most decision-making responsibility in the room, that is when the tide will begin to shift. So when we're talking, for example, Hector, about your background and your community as an indigenous person, right? It shouldn't even be people like me or my friend Sandy. Sorry, no, I, I don't identify as indigenous. I, I'm, I'm, I'm Apache, thank you. And say that, say that for, again, I missed it. I am Apache, not indigenous, thank you. Your passion? I am Apache, Apache of the Apache Nation, not indigenous. I'm, I'm sorry, my auditory disability, I misheard that. And I apologize. So as an Apache person, right, it is not my place at all, firstly, to tell you how to identify. That's wrong of me to do. And secondly, although I'm a person of color and I experience racism, I do not belong in a conversation about what return to Apache sovereignty looks like. That's not my place. On the other hand, if we're talking about what does it look like for Chinese Americans? What does it look like for non-binary people? What are policies that most affect us? Then people like me should be the ones that have the most power in the room. Or Mariah and Max, for you as black people, I'm not black, it's not my job to talk about what it is that is right to address anti-blackness or how to lead on policies that most harmfully affect black communities. Just like it's not my place to talk about what policies affect Apache communities. And it's not my place. So whenever we're having a policy conversation, our question to ourselves should be, am I even the right person to be leading this conversation? Because sometimes that answer is no, even if we're already marginalized. And if I am the wrong person, how do I make sure that I can actually give up whatever power I might have in this situation so that power goes back to the people who need to be in charge, not me. Was Hector next? Um, if you feel comfortable. Uh, thank you, this is Hector. I'll, I wanna hear what everybody else has to say. I, so I, I wanna cede my time, I really, um, I, I lost where I was going to go. Um, then I will guess I go first, I think. All right. Um, so 
I would say for this question, for me, um, it begins with service providers like recognizing that people from different cultures have different ideas about like what it means to have a disability. It takes time to understand what is important to a person and their family. For example, being independent is important to most people with you know, disabilities, but independence looks different in the lives of people with disability, uh, uh, in the lives of, uh, okay, I lost it. Okay, here's, I got the words now. Independence looks different um, in the lives of people with different cultural backgrounds. Um, that's what I was trying to say. I got it. Um, so being anti-racist is recognizing the health disparities that are experienced by people of color. Um, service providers need education on the many ways people of color do not have good health outcomes. And this way they can recognize when someone is not getting the health care they need and advocate to correct this injustice. Um, let's see, all of us, but especially service providers, uh, require ongoing training and coaching on being respectful and accepting to people from different cultures. Um, a support person's job description should reflect uh, you know, what a person needs to do to work with people from different cultures. Um, the diversity of the people who live in the community should match the diversity of staff that work for an agency. Um, I'm sure you are aware of this issue. I do, I do want to mention that many people with disabilities do not speak English. Uh, agency resources need to be set aside to access in-person and video translation services. And this includes getting interpreters for the deaf. Um, and another um, need is for service providers to get better at addressing needs related to sexual orientation. A uh, self-advocate named uh, Thomas said, and this is his words, staff just assume I am straight and they tell anti-gay jokes in front of me. You know, we need to work together to create services and supports that are welcoming to all people. I also believe, I think in a nutshell, what Lydia was trying to say earlier about the power pieces, uh, people who are oppressed need to be in power because when they are put in power, they can uh, take charge in addressing through experience the problems in our country and in our world faces. Absolutely. Um, Raya, Sandy, would either of you like to go? Sure, um, I can just say uh, very quickly um, in response to this question that I think in order for new systems to be created without biases and barriers, and that there needs to be disabled people of color need to be part of not just the building of the pipelines and um, the system, but also the vision building at the end of that system of at the end of that pipeline, right? So like, what is what is our collective um, liberation and our collective access look like? And that also needs to be really informed by racial justice and um, disabled people of color, um, disabled black and indigenous people of color. Um, and, and I think that, you know, when it comes to, for instance, access to care, um, who is on the panel and committee that determines whether a disabled person of color is going to be considered a worthy candidate for a ventilator? Um, but then like moving a step further back behind that though is who gets to be a part of writing the guidelines that standards of care panel will follow to make those decisions. Um, so I think that building systems that do not have bias uh, first record requires that we as a community need to recognize that bias exists. Um, and I think that to Lydia's point earlier about power, part of that power and, and the difficulty I think that 
some of our white disabled leaders um, are, are unwilling to do is, is that to relinquish power means that they need to recognize that they, they have bias, that we all have bias, um, but um, that we also need to be having transparent conversation at the policy level about ableism, racism, homophobia, autism, um, and other forms of systemic oppression that we all have been complicit in at some point. And lastly, I, I, I'm gonna try to answer this question um, by my, you know, prefacing this by saying that well, I have a preference for qualitative information rather than quantitative. Um, so, so to that point, you know, when we are um, having policy discussion and making, creating policies that we are not just looking at survey data um, and national data sets, and, and then not also considering the lived experiences and the stories that disabled people are, are sharing in our communities, that we need both. Um, and so, you know, this, this looks like elevating lived experiences and participating in panels like this. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that to create systems that do not have bias in them, that there needs to be a framework of disability justice and uh, more specifically intersectionality within um, the collective work that we're doing at the policy level. And this is Hector. I wanted to speak on that question. I, I think right now, as we're really redesigning systems and we're going into a new administration and we're looking into leadership, uh, we really need to look at the disability movement um, as kind of how it has been going so far. And it's gotten us really far so far, uh, but it, it, it's not gonna get, it's not gonna take us much further um, if we don't revamp it. And I think this is where we look at, you know, where we can find disability activists uh, in, in time of COVID, you know, in the streets protesting, organizing, crip camp, crip to vote, the young, the young people really kind of really pushing the narratives, really challenging these conversations, making everybody uncomfortable with the truth. Uh, you know, so I think it's important uh, to, yeah, perhaps, you know, change systems, but also build new ones. Uh, you know, I, I look at, at this organization, this agency, and as, as somebody who's autistic, who, who, who's, you know, I, 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 I has been dealing with this for a long time. It's amazing to be in a space like this. Uh, it's amazing. And I know it could not have happened if it wasn't because people said there's nothing really for us. We can go and play by somebody else's rules or we can do our own thing. And that's what we need to do right now. The disability movement changes over generations. And this is a new generation. This is completely unprecedented uh, for all of us. So I think we really need to be at these conversations with the new administration and, and hitting up to be at every in every conversation, especially with the COVID recovery team that he has right now. We need some disability people there. We need advocates. We need people that are surviving. We need people that are struggling, people that have those type of commentaries. Uh, because I think, and I speak this for myself, I, you know, over the years, the system changes you and you become almost kind of academic or policy. And we look at everything sort of in those terms and it narrows and is what the system does. That's one of the consequences that happens from working with, with, from within. You become very narrow and we sometimes start even using the same language that oppresses us and we use it to oppress others. Uh, and I think one of the things that this organization Asan, has really done is to show everybody else that that is not the model. We really have to readopt it. Um, and I'm just, I, I, I'm not passing on my torch, my, my, my leadership torch to anybody. I'm just telling you all right now, I'm gonna light everybody's torch and we're just gonna burn this motherfucker down. You know, we need to burn it down. Uh, Cause it's, it's and <laughs> that's part of my fresh, uh, because that, that's what we need to do. This system has continuously oppressed us and killed us. And we're looking at it right now. That's the proof. That's the qualitative and the quantitative. You know, we look at the numbers, we look at the stories. Uh, and I'm just so, I'm so glad that I, that I got to listen to you. I think I really needed to hear all of you. I was feeling for a while kind of down. So it's, it's, I'm just, and this is 
me as an old timer, what I need, uh, because I'm just so invigorated to see all of you moving along. And I'm just going to do every damn thing I can to elevate all of you, because that's what I do as an elder. I elevate our young disability rights advocates and give them the keys. Go burn it down. You and this here. is Hector, literal disclaimer, sorry, don't burn anything down, I, that's just metaphorically. For legal purposes. No. <laughs> we know what you meant, we know what you meant. We know. <laughs> Go ahead, Raya. This is Raya. Um, uh, oh, oh, I just realized, was there an image description done for anybody? Um, so I I am a dark skin. Okay, I've been I've been told I'm not dark skin. I am a chocolate, <laughs> um, medium brown skin, black non-binary person, and I have fluff balls on my head. Um, I'm wearing a what is this blue shirt and a um, blue feather pendant that is a stem necklace and in the background it's decorated with like what is that like green with black trees um and okay my sorry that's a thing my brain does i'm like ah. okay uh to answer number three i'm really glad that i came after hector because like i was like i'm i'm not a policy person that is not my strength <laughs> i i am wanting to learn more about policy but i again like i just know where i'm at right now and honoring what that is and what that is is community and that's if you're ever in my inner circle like i'm always afraid that i'm annoying people by saying the word too much because i'm just like community this community that um and it's so important like yes policy yes changing systems but also what is it that the communities are saying? Like, yes, you, you basically have like the delegation member where it's like, oh, they're helping, they need to be in the room, but also what what is the bodies of community saying? What What's the work that's being done? What are the things that are being complained about? What are the things that are being enjoyed? And I sincerely believe that it's the work that the community does that drives forth anything else. Because at the end of the day, like the system, the governmental system is not for any of us. So, and I've been stepping more into understanding what abolition means for me, my body and, and my friends' experiences. And so at the end of the day, like, like for instance, like I'm for land back. Land back can't exist with like the current structures of the government. Um, and I want to, so I yeah, if we're going to talk about how are we going to advance policy, we also need to be looking into how how are we reminding people and how are people reminding themselves and encouraging others to pivot to what's being done in the communities. Um, Cause it, and again, what Hector said, like it gets to the point where everyone has their jargon. Um, and so it's, you know, it's all about who read what and like what meeting was this person at and and like this is good work but it, it gets lost and and at the end of the day it's like people should be in the room to make sure that they're helping to bring the light what the community is out crying about so if we're talking in within uh disability justice uh well Within disability rights, the aspect that gets lost, as we know a lot, is anything involving racial justice. So if we're talking about creating policy for disabled people, being mindful of people of color, like police, anything always has to be somewhere involved in that. Um, I, and that's like one of, I remember one of my pet peeves was, not even pet peeves, like I, mid, mid pandemic i i was like when after george floyd happened like i was so distraught and broken down because i realized that um and i, I think i had consulted with nor about this too i had realized that out of all the disabled organizations that exist most of them don't care about my life and so um as people who are putting together policies being mindful that like Black and brown bodies are are watching what you are and aren't doing. 
and how you disinclude what intersects with our lives directly impacts our ability to live. Um, and and, and it's, it's scary. Um, but then that also goes into my second point where um, poly, like peer supports, like there needs to be the encouraging of peer supports. I'm not sure how people who work in policy can, well, I mean, anyone can do this, but if you're, if you're working within that realm, also being encouraging things like peer supports and helping to uh, make people aware of that. Um, uh, one of the organizations that really inspires me, well, two of them is Project Let's and Herd. Um, Project Let's because of how they create a lot of resources to minimize contact with the police. So as we're taking the steps to on a policy level, um, remove and defund the power of the police, we are having the supports prepared and set up to still like be able to function in a safe way. And then with um, HERD, um, making sure that people know what their rights are. Um, deaf and disabled people are just constantly um, taken advantage of and abused by the police. And then once um, we end up in the prisons, which um, I think Lydia might have mentioned, but uh, over the, ma the majority of jails and prisons are made up of disabled people. Um, and, and it's very inaccessible in there. Uh, I don't know if that is a shocker to anybody. Um, and they're making profits off of the disabled people. They're making profits off of people of color. They're making profits off of poor people. And like that's the majority of jails and prisons. Um, and, and so when we, I feel like I'm going on a tangent. I apologize. I, I warned y'all this might happen. Um, so how, how are we, that can also go into how are we directing funding into those kinds of organizations who are already doing that work. Um, not everything is about spearheading. A lot is about making sure that the people who are doing the work have the resources that they need. Um, I, it is ridiculously ridiculous um, how difficult it is to find like grants for just casual accessibility um, and, and anything within that realm. Um, but yeah, like I, th those are my things. <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry. No, you're completely fine. You actually gave me a really good segue into our next question, so that helps. <laughs> so our next question um, kind of touches on what you were talking about here, which is that the disability community, um, including neurodiversity spaces, has a really long history um, of issues in terms of racism. White disabled activists have often monopolized the conversation, excluded disabled people of color from decision-making, failed to work with racial justice movements, and have often received a disproportionate amount of credit and accolades for their work. So how can white disabled people start to address the harm that's been caused to disabled people of color? And how can we create a better community together? And I know this is gonna be a hot topic, so feel free to just kind of jump in. Um, just as a quick time check, we have about 15 minutes left. It's okay if we go a little bit over, but we might end up lightning rounding the last question, just, just so you're prepared. <laughs> All right, so I'll say my answer to this. Um, so for this, there are like many people of color with autism and intellectual disabilities but not many of us have professional jobs as disability advocates. And I'm often asked to join boards or committees. What I have experienced is that it is one thing to be at the table, but quite another to be taken seriously. We appreciate the opportunity to like share our experiences and to give um, advice. However, we need to be in lead roles to have our ideas put into motion. Um, disability organizations need to practice what they preach when it comes to inclusion. This is a great need for leadership opportunities for people of color with all types of disabilities, especially those with intellectual disabilities. And I know 
it is hard to change the way an organization does business, but we need to look at what we do and ask ourselves, are we running our organizations in a culturally sensitive way? Is there a true commitment to always providing information in plain language? Um, to make progress in this, we, we have to make sure that any organizations uh, we work with address these two questions. If we want our world to be accessible to all, we need to make sure that our organizations are truly leading the way. And my final comment is that my, in, uh, uh, my um, entry into the disability rights world was through SABE, which stands for Self-Advocates Becoming Empowered. For 30 years, they have always had board members and leaders with diverse backgrounds. And they have been a role model for how the cultural backgrounds of our leaders must match the racial and cultural backgrounds of the people we represent. This is Hector. Uh, I'll add briefly to that. I, I definitely, uh, definitely, um, what Max Max just mentioned is important. But I think you know we have to realize that sometimes always money talks. So I think there are also like I'm in California, and you know we just recently passed uh, a board uh, a measure at a state level to make sure that boards are diversified. But at the state level, I'm part of Disability Rights California, which is the largest uh, one of the largest disability rights agencies in the country. And we're not very diverse, uh, you know, and or we're becoming diverse. At the, at the national level, we also have all these CEOs and they're all lawyers. And I'm one of the two disabled people on our board. And I think um, one of the things that we really have to do is we really have to look at the trauma approaches that the, the trauma that happens in our boards when we're tokens and the lack of work that happens to our community when we're just there as representative items, you know, either to a lift. And, and show that maybe an agency is not racist because they have us or because, you know, some of our white leaders uh, want us on their board so they can say that they're not racist. And uh, I know at Disability Rights California, you know, we just had this conversation. We've been working on this uh, relentlessly, uh, painfully. And for me, it's been very, very toxic to, to push it. But it, it has happened. We started to really change policies. Um, you know, to ensure that we not only do we have disability representation leading uh, those conversations and board meetings, but that they are significantly representative of the communities that we serve in California. We're primarily Latino uh, residents, but we only have two Latino people on our entire board uh, and none of us are in a leadership position. Uh, so I think it's important to have representative uh, priorities, uh, but also you know, regional and categorical representation. Because it's an aggregate, uh, we can't just take one model and expect it to work. We kind of have to combine it. Um, and when it does not happen, then I think it's important to have representative organizations like an autistic organization or a black autistic organization and or Native American autistic organization. Some of my uh, Native uh, autistic folks, you know, we, we love the work that Asan does, but you, you, we primarily see it as an East Coast type of organization. So we have kind of our own membership, which is not, it's totally different. Uh, autistic natives are a little bit different sometimes because uh, that's a different culture. But I think we also need to have uh, money follow. Uh, when agencies are not diverse, uh, then really start thinking about why we're funding them or why they're being designated with, with leadership you know, responsibilities to take care of people that they don't really represent their boards. Um, and that's, that's unfortunately, you know, the reality of the truth, uh, but it is something that does need to happen and it's for the better. Um, you know, no agency will ever really do good work if the people leading it are not the people that are being impacted. Thank you. Uh, Raya, would you like to go next? I hope that you guys can see me, well, y'all can see me because, you know, it's dark. 
and uh, this is becoming a challenge for me. Um, so what I have down is more so um, highlighting on intersectionality. Um, this is something that like, why disabled people need to understand what intersectionality actually is, not what they perceived it to be. Like Kimberly Crenshaw didn't put out this word for it to be misrepresented, but yet yeah, that's the, the, the pattern. Uh, understanding that it's um, it's not about who's the most oppressed, it's about being able to to piece together how the different aspects and experiences and marginalizations like create their own experience, um, which means that disabled disability will always be a race issue. That's a, something that we hear over and over again, where people, uh, white disabled people, insist, "Oh, well, we're a disability organization. We don't focus on that." Or, "Oh, why can't like why do you always keep bringing racism into this? This is disability." Like, I, as hard as I could try, though I won't, I cannot separate my blackness from my autisticness. Like my my trauma response to the George Floyd situation was both of those things merging together. It was not me being black. It was not me being autistic. It was those experiences coming together. Um, and I just like we we really can't go anywhere if people can't even acknowledge that race race issues and racism are disability issues um and we can't go anywhere if why disabled people are uncomfortable with challenging themselves and their friends and their family members um because yeah compliant com being compliant to the oppression of others is still oppression if you're sitting in a group, whether it's virtual or in person, and you're watching someone dogpile on a disabled person of color for Lord knows whatever reasons, um, that's that's racism. I don't know why this is really hard to understand. Uh, like, um, and yes, I just 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 stuff like that. Like, Stop being racist. I, I don't I don't know how to challenge that any further. Intersectionality isn't about who's the most special. It's about this experience is specific, and and the, it, it, to be white and disabled is one experience that is not the default. Um and and to be of whatever ethnic group on top of that like that's that's a whole it's a whole different thing. I, sorry, I'm struggling because I just don't understand how to help. But I would, I would, yep. Please, please read existing literature. Um, disability, you can go to sinsandvalid.com and they have a great resource on disability justice to understand um, how you can integrate racial justice within disability rights. Um, and yeah yep yep call call people out check yourself don't make it all about you if somebody says something in a way that you didn't like just because you were in the wrong it's not their job to fix their tone it's your job to pause and listen and if someone calls out bigotry that you don't see it's not because it's not there it's because either you weren't paying attention or a part of your privilege is that you just just wasn't even there. Um, I'm just gonna stop there because I just I just be repeating myself at that point. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so we have one more question that we're just going to kind of lightning round, um, just so that we can be respectful of everyone's time and try not to go super far into the ether, which is the way of these panels. <laughs> Um, so our final question is, how can we as disabled people of color reach out to and provide support and resources to members of our community? And how can we support each other and fight for change? 
I'll be as quick as possible with this one. Um, it starts, we educate people that, um, sell, that the self-advocacy movement is a civil rights movement. And we explain how we are connected to other civil rights movements. As a disability rights organization, we are constantly reminding ourselves that people have lots of different parts of who they are. Nothing About Us Without Us is the theme song for the self-advocacy movement. We are constantly reminding ourselves to look around the room and see who is at the table and who are the leaders running our groups. Um, nothing about us without us means that we must include people with disabilities from different cultures living in our state. We want to know if something is helping or hurting them. And together we speak up to end discrimination. Now, as you know, that, I mean, as you know, this is not easy. And people grow up hearing lots of false ideas said about people with different cultural backgrounds. Often people pass on what they've heard. They pass on the hate, but we have got to be the ones to change things. And we encourage people uh, by saying, quote, we don't have to go by what you are being taught, end quote. We work to learn the facts. And after all, self-advocacy is all about questioning opinions and speaking up well. At times, that means calling people out for what they say and do. It's not easy, but we need, but we do not want to be the people that repeat history. And um, one action is to uh, is for the, your disability organization to reach out to work with other social justice groups. For years, I know Green Mountain Self Advocates (GMSA) has prioritized partnering with organizations that are outside of the disability community. And we have learned uh, many lessons from groups like Migrant Justice, the NAACP, I forgot what that stands for, but I know who they are. And um, Justice for All, Race Against Racism, and the list goes on, and how to collect and shape people's stories, how to effectively work with the press. For us, it increased opportunities opportunities of leadership and self-advocacy and self for well leadership for self-advocates for example when their social justice uh, when social justice groups like the ones i mentioned have meetings with the governor they always invite us to be there and it gives us an opportunity to speak and so um when they have a rally they go out of their way to give people a ride uh, to the events, um, people with disabilities, rides to the events, um, policy makers pay attention to the facts that we are all there together. Um, our movements coming together shows how our, our individual concerns interconnect and become one issue that we can all tackle together. Um, and it is clear um, that we can we can't we can't have disability rights without working to eliminate racism within our systems. So that's my answer. This is Hector. I'll just quickly. I think you know. I I, I think right now COVID has changed the landscape completely for the disability community. Um, I don't know a single person who is not experiencing anxiety or depression, despair or grief or fear. Um, it feels a little bit better now with the election still gone, but we're all, I, 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 I'm, I feel like I'm, I'm living with PTSD, like trauma, and, like Trump trauma, uh, COVID trauma. You know, it's, it's, and I'm not being political, I'm just being factual. And I think one of the ways that I do it is really just uh, to, you know, guide people to disability organizations as much as I can, uh, bring, uh, you know, diversity, younger folks with me. Uh, and instead of talking, instead of using my 20 minutes, I go, here's 20 minutes, listen to them. Uh, and, you know, these are the people, the organizations that need to lead the way. Uh, I, I am like a human door stopper right now. Um, and. What I do is just connect people uh, so they can try to survive, to help their community to survive. Because each and every single one of you are those people 
that will not only help your communities thrive and survive, but you are also the people that are going to lead and are leading the disability community through the most horrible thing I have ever experienced in my life. And we're not done. We're nowhere done with what's going on. Um, so I think, you know, the main thing is just connect with your protection aid and protection advocacy agency in each state. Join it, you know, see if you can be the board, make yourself heard, tell them what you want and them to do, you know, don't take no for an answer. And if they tell you no, you know, go somewhere else and tell them that they told me no. What did you tell me? And keep going because what do you have to do? What do you have to lose? Your community. And that's a big thing. That's that's unacceptable. So I'm going to go ahead and I'll, I'll put the, my NDRN information in there. And, you know, I'm just I, I'm just blown away by everything here in a good way. Thank you. Sandy, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, my thoughts around this question, um, I'm just going to center it around this idea of self-preservation, because I think that our history of disabled people of color has shown us that really no matter who is in office, right, whether our country is living in a new normal or the old normal, the reality of disabled people of color is that our realities have always been at stake, like our lives have always been at risk. Um, and so this notion of self-preservation is about, I think, accepting the idea that um, for all of the fights ahead that we already know about and are, are preparing for and are actively involved in, um, there are just as many that we do not foresee. There's, there's going to be, a, and I, I apologize for my language, but there's a shit storm coming our way that we don't even know about yet. Um, but to be in that fight together and collectively, um, I think self-preservation for us is, is important. Um, and so concretely what that looks like um, is that to survive the cycle, whatever we do today, um, however large or small, is important and has value outside of whatever effort for change that is happening in the environment and in the system beyond us. Um, so an example of self-preservation, I'm just gonna talk very briefly about too, um, is mutual aid, right? We see that on the ground, whether it's around climate justice, whether it's around providing PPE for folks um, on a really neighborhood to neighborhood and community level. Um, because of the pandemic, I think that mutual aid groups have experienced on a national level, greater visibility for our country. But when we look at the history of our community, we know that mutual aid groups has been the way our communities have survived for centuries, right? We take care of our own because our survival cannot depend on the system, cannot depend on public health, cannot depend on the government and politics. Um, and so secondly, the other really concrete way that preservation can happen is to journal. Um, that's something that I personally have um, taken up more consistently this year. But what I mean by that is that disabled people of color have spent so much time just trying to survive day to day that we're not doing enough to also to perhaps pause and reflect on what is working in our communities and what is not. And I think that the value in that is not just for ourselves in, in our own communities in this immediate time, but also because we know that this is not the first and it's not gonna be the last pandemic. I wanna be able to tell disabled people of color in the future, like this is how we survive. This is what worked for us. Like here's, here's our words, here's the evidence of what we've done and to leave something behind. Um, so yeah, that, that's my thought, self-preservation. Excellent, thank you for sharing that with us. Raya, would you like to close us out? Yes. Um... So this is one of my favorite questions because community things. Conversations are great. They have been my lifeline. Um, honestly, the, the, yeah, the amount of Black disabled, Black autistic people who I've had access to talk with has been amazing in my healing journey. And so I know for a fact that even just by talking with your fellow disabled people of color, that can be super empowering. Um, and understanding that even in our similarities, our intersects are different and taking the time to learn deeper into what those differences are, the histories, the cultures, the privileges we may hold around them. Disability justice, not just for, um, for others, but also within our own practices. So Sandy highlighted on just like, what are we doing for, to pause? Like that's a rest, 
and pausing, that's a part of disability justice. Joy is a part of disability justice. It's not just about how we're going to burn the entire building down. Um, <laughs> and in, let's see here, encouraging people to not doubt themselves um, without shaming any trauma that may have caused that doubt to occur. Um, and then really closing out on something that I've been learning more about, uh, which is learning about things, especially for us in the US, um, that happen outside of our proximity. Um, like recently, I had learned about the new national special education policy that was launched in Brazil this past October, which is basically a separate but equal adaption um, that has disabled Brazilians rightfully up in arms. It's good to be aware what is going on internationally because disabled BIPOC are all over. Our experiences are similar but different. Um, but even at home where we're at, there could be people whose intersex is associated with international affairs. And it's and, and that additional level of burden um, and trauma that they have to experience could be aided by us, us being aware and, and being there for them. Um, solidarity is always great inspiring people to be themselves and knowing that that's enough. Um, and yeah. Absolutely. I wanted to take a second to thank all of our panelists for joining in and for sharing your lives and your expertise and your information with us. I wanted to take a second to thank everyone who joined in. Um, Again, I want to emphasize uh, that particularly for disabled people of color, these conversations can be really physically, mentally, emotionally taxing and to take care of yourself, whatever that looks like for you. Um, as a reminder to all of our participants, uh, our closing remarks will be going up fairly soon. Uh, keep an eye out on your emails to see the link for that, or it'll also be cross-posted to our social media closer to the event actually taking place. So thank you everyone again for coming out and have an excellent rest of your night. Bye.